as Dylan Thomas said, to begin at the beginning, which is sometimes the end and sometimes the beginning. I'd finished my book of poems. All I needed was a title. One day, I was driving up the island, and just beyond Classic Road, there's a red mailbox, and written in bold script, love letters only. I was so excited, I got out of the car and took a picture, and thought, yes, I'm at the end. But in reality, I was only just at the beginning. What happened next was to hurl us into a new journey and a new understanding of those words, love letters only. A few weeks later, my husband Robin was diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was the beginning of a heartbreaking eight months. Love became more important than anything we'd done, gained, achieved, or accumulated. This is part of a poem I wrote for our 30th wedding anniversary, which was about 11 years ago. What do you say about a man who can't wait to start the day, would knock over paint pots with enthusiasm, show up in Parliament to heckle for the underdog, taunt his conservative uncle that he intends to nationalize the stock exchange? He's allegiance to truth, not to safe passage. A force of character, a sheltering immensity of heart. The shock of the diagnosis, the shock of seeing the melanoma lit up on the PT scan was indescribable. We went away for a few days to get our bearings, and I watched him riding along the riverbank. He was still strong and vibrant. That man, that man riding a bike through Queen Anne's Lace is mine. Sturdy shoulders, castle of bone and beauty. How can this be happening? How can some vagrant cell march like the Gestapo through his bones and liver? As if dark occupation can silence him. In the middle of the night, under tonnage of sadness. Mystery is the only lover that hauls you into safety beneath the stars. Pass the musical instruments while variables calculate and weep. Play a song that includes flowers, the faceless worms doing the best they can. Wings and flight, always flight. And softening the islands, a small breeze as if hope did not matter anymore. As the illness progressed, we felt as though God was having a heyday with his identity and his life. Robin, God is upstairs throwing your stuff away. Wedding pictures, certificates, awards, camping gear, and tax forms. Thrashing around, she has found your battered briefcase tossing that too, making her way noisily downstairs. We have lit candles, the muscular tide taking you through an irreversible exit. You're breathing like the sea sucking pebbles on its way out. Your limbs fragile rafters for your ebbing organs and flesh. Keep your eyes on the great light. Do not be distracted, my darling, you can do it. In the darkness, a lantern in the wind for your greatest crossing, your giving heart, the only currency worth anything in her celestial city. While Robin was ill, I tried to imagine what it would be, be to live without him after 44 years. This poem's called Gone. I first fell for your sonorous voice. Its truth an octave deeper and so loved me more than anyone in the world. Quite frankly, when you were fast declining, no wasting away, I kept busy, but the nights refused my conquering pace. I had no way to silence imagination. 
no blinkers for its hoarse demands. I rehearsed arriving home without a sound from your study. That certain cough when paying the bills. The chair flying back and you, large, glad, full of pronouncement. I want to find you home again, even for a second. But you are gone, more gone than gone. Robin died on January the 27th on a misty afternoon at home in his study with, with his family and books around him. The Crossing. Death, the Amiga that enters the helpless room and claims with grim precision the one. We cling to the rattling breath, to the edge that opens like a dark overcoat, clamping a cloth on your lips as foam curled from your once articulate mouth. A quantum pain sears our impotent hearts as your organs unravel and shunt. This is death. This is heartbreaking. Yes, there is peace, readiness, and maturity. To be honest, the moment is unbearable. God's final discipline, impossible to perfect. A few days before he died, he prom we, we talked about it, and we decided that he would text me. He didn't text me, but I got these words in a poem. Your last text. Do not think of my labored breath, what it took to leave this body, how I reached out to prevent the sucking down of the void in the last hours. I am not sick. It has been days in the famous death journey. My darling, I am nearing the winds of freedom. It's incredible. It's magnificent. This light, this crystal universe, this larger language. Hold to my heart. I have wings and span a greater globe. That winter of 2014, I didn't really want spring to come. In fact, I didn't care if it ever came again. This poem's called Prolong Winter. Leave the wheelbarrow locked in ice. In white tears of snowdrops, prevent the birds from filling the garden with song. I want to walk on the frozen pond with my heart groaning and creaking. I want to stay under the blankets with the sound of the wind from the north in the wilderness of your leaving. Spring has promise, but the promise I want to make is to the rawness of life. Let the river flood through and make the reeds lie flat. The mud shift into deep valleys. Let the cold work on every tissue until with each miraculous breath I walk again across greening fields. I remember getting a letter from one of my family saying, put a, try and put a limit on grief. I couldn't. I let the tears come wherever and whenever they wanted. I couldn't manipulate or shorten this sorrow. Grief. Do not dry up your tears for the sake of a world in terror of death. Or reach for the efficiency of Kleenex. Let sadness come unhindered. Your salty water flow big as the Pacific Sea, as snowmelt from the Olympics. Wide as the wilderness, in glory of every wing, every blossoming flower, every blade of grass, every seed becoming, every falling leaf, all decaying life. Your robust tears for your, for your beloved, 
for every pulsing cell on this stunning earth made of original love. Thich Nhat Hanh said, if you are alone, you might sink in the river of suffering. If you have a community of practice and you allow it to embrace your pain and sorrow, you will float. We felt as though the community was flying in formation with us. And my close women friends, wingtip to wingtip. This is a poem I wrote for my women. There you are, installed at the arrivals, when he could not take one more step. I'm talking about love in the middle of a working day that turns up with duvet, sponge bag, sleeping remedies, and a certain brand of tea. How many hold on from behind, step by step, so there's no falling back? How many partnerships are willing to hang out in the merciless demands of departure and return for the marathon of grief? As if compassion was a vineyard stored in the cellars of your hearts. In 2002, a very dear friend of ours died, very young, in her 40s. And she had an amazing ability to debate with Robin, which I can tell you was no easy feat. <laughs> he was the president of the Oxford Debating Society. <laughs> so, you can, <laughs> so you can see how difficult that was. So this is a poem called Girlfriend. Have you slept with him yet? The two of you in the place we dread? I know he once voted Republican. You said you would only bed a Democrat. <laughs> I tried to imagine your meeting, standing in your distinct way as if you were on a rocking ship. Him, delighted to see you, ready with debate. I hope he's not arguing with the great spirit, though inclined to think he is. Dustman and president all the same to him. Thank heavens you are there to supervise preparations. He's polyester snakeskin shirt, a dubious sense of style. <laughs> Maybe you are both inside out, lit up like fireflies. Are thoughts visible to you, even colored? Tell him I love him and I'm only just across the border. Thank you.